Welcome to My Life, Chassidus Applied, episode 31. I've been speaking in the previous weeks about events in the Middle East, Israel, and one question I think I must open up with. Someone asked, what connection do world events, even in Israel, have with My Life, Chassidus Applied? It's a very good question, and I feel I should address it before anything else. Well, firstly, the whole point of Torah and Chassidus, like the Rambam Paskins in the end of Hilchus Hanukkah, that Kol HaTorah le'nitna l'lasa shalom ba'elam. The whole Torah was given to bring peace to this world. Torah includes, of course, Chassidus. And those that learn Chassidus and learn the Biyurim that Chassidus talks about how Torah brings peace, it's about not just peace between uh, the Eyu, friend to another, one person to another, but it's also peace between the world and God, peace between one person and himself or herself. And Chassidus is an integral component in achieving both personal peace and global peace. And as the Rambam there, Paskin, what does he say? Shalom Ba'elam. He's bringing it concerning Shalom Ba'ez, concerning peace and harmony at home. So firstly, Chassidus is concerned not just with the individual, but with the world as well. Which is why you find, starting from the Alter Rebbe, who was concerned with events in the world, the Mispal, the famous Rosh Hashanah story, how he woke up earlier to blow Schaefer in order to ensure that Alexander of Russia would win over Napoleon of France, because of the entire reason of France being uh, maybe more physically easier for the Jews, but spiritually would be far more challenging, etc. And all the way to the Rebbe. Al Medin is Boya Omer, we say in Rosh Hashanah, and the Rebbe we see in many Sikhs talking about world events, especially at Yisrael. So it's part of Chassidus too. It's not so called pol- politics. Tate is not political, Tate is God's will and God's plan for this universe, both individually and collectively. So it definitely fits into Chassidus applied. Yet at the same time, my life, like another person writes, um, that I have to deal with my own personal depression. I have to deal with my own challenges. Though I understand the importance of uh, events in the Middle East, events in Eretz Yisrael, and my prayers go out to my brothers and sisters there, but at the end of the day, what does that have to do with my personal well-being? Well, this is part, so this comes answer number two to the question. Elam koten ze adam, a fundamental principle in Yiddishkeit in general, in Teda and Chassidus in particular, is the idea of microcosm, macrocosm. The human being is a small universe, a universe in microcosm, and the universe is a large organism. And the way we behave and the way we live our lives personally affects the world, and what happens in the world affects us personally, whether you know it or not. When the Rambam says, for example, that, so often cited by the Rebbe, that a person has to always see himself, as if the entire world, everything is balanced, and that zchuyas, mitzvahs, are equally balanced with, God forbid, the negative. And one act, ma'isa echad, dibur echad, machshava achas, one thought, one word, one act, can tip the scale. Not just the scale in your own personal life, the scale of the universe. How is that possible? Because besides the fact that every act has its butterfly effect using a scientific uh, modern contemporary scientific ideas that a, typh- that a butterfly um, uh, flaps its wings in Kansas City and it creates a typhoon in Singapore. Besides that, it's also microcosm, macrocosm. Because we are, each of us is a complete universe. And as such, we correspond. Everything in the world corresponds to our actions. And that's why when you do something in your personal life, it affects you and the entire world. And vice versa. Some of us know more of the details of it, and some do not. But to suggest that world events, especially in Eretz Yisrael, which is not just a Jewish land and a holy land and a promised land, it's the interface, the portal between heaven and earth, this is the gate to heaven. So what events there are absolutely connected to our personal lives and vice versa. And that's why when the Rebbe spoke about this, and he spoke about how even here in the United States or other places, our behavior and our actions have impact, direct impact on the events in Eretz Yisrael. It helps them, strengthen them, reinforce them spiritually, but even physically. And we'll talk more about that a little later in this uh, episode. But I just wanted to open up with this, 
because I don't want to think I'm getting detracted with other subject matter, besides the fact that it's in headlines and it's on our minds, what's going on at Yisrael and so on, but it's also absolutely related to the Dahiros and directives of the Rabbeim. And that's why you see most of Miftsoim of the Rebbe, most of the campaigns were connected directly to events in Eretz Yisrael. The Miftsit film began in Tavshel Chavzayin, 1967, Shavuot's time, a direct link, link to the Six Day War, Shmira, protection, Vyoro Mimeko, Vrokalame Oret, Vyoro Mimeko, the film's power to create strength and build courage and drive fear into the enemy. Malot, which was a tragic terrorist attack in northern Israel, was the provoked Mifza Mezuzah, another form of Shemitah. That was later in 1972, 1973. The Yom Kippur War rise right around then when all the other Mifzayim began. And then the other Mifzayim were either directly or almost directly connected to events in Israel. And Mifzayim are all personal mitzvahs. Tefillin, Mezuzah, Teira, Ba'ayas Mola Zvarim, Zokah. And of course, even the bigger ones, Chinuch, Avis Yisrael, and the three for the women, Neshek, Taras Mishpoch, and Kasher Shachil Vishtiyah, are all both personal but collective effects. And they're interlinked and always connected. And finally, the Mishnah, Chayiv Adam Leim Bishvili Nivra Elam. person has to always, why Lifikach Nivra Adam Yechidi, why was Adam Adishan created as an individual, not as part of a herd, part of a group, even part of a, a, a bait? as an individual, to teach, that, er, teach us that every human being has to always see himself as an individual and feel, not in an arrogant way, but in a humble way and responsible way, that I, the entire world was created for me, and what am I doing to affect my, the world around me? So it has to absolutely concern us to understand the events in the, in, in, just around the Middle East, including B'nai Yishmol and B'nai Esav and B'nai, of course, Avram, Yitzhak, V'yakov, and know that our actions make a difference. Our actions make a difference in our personal lives and collectively. And sometimes, actually, when there's a crisis, when there's a challenge, it compels us to rise to the occasion and get mobilize ourselves, draft ourselves into the army. As I discussed, there's a spiritual part of the army, there's the physical part of the army, especially by in. So we have to absolutely see ourselves linked to all these events, and understanding them is not just a, is not just a nice option, it's incumbent upon us to understand it, to know how to act. And we have, thank God, from the Rebbe and from the Rabbeim before, as I'd already uh, elaborated a bit in the previous episode, the Rebbe Marash's Maimir Matzazu, Tafresh Mem, the letter and answer from the Rebbe to Rabbi Greenglass. You can refer to the last episode, fascinating answer. The Zoyas that were both that, that uh, the Rebbe Tzeichen there and uh, Rabbi Greenglass as well. Seif Pasha Ve'era, Zeir Seif Pasha, the end of Pasha Ve'era, this is in Zeir Chelik Beis, Shmois, and Zeir Chelik Gimel, Seif Parsha Bolok, in addition to the Yalkut Shemeni about Melech Poras, etc., etc. These are things that are part of Chesidus, part of Teda, and help, actually help us understand the world better, understand ourselves personally better. And I, finally, I want to add one more thing. I keep saying finally, because there's so much to say, so I, I, maybe I shouldn't say finally. There's always more, but there's the famous Maimer, and I think I cited it as well, Kael Deidi. The, from Tovshin Tess. That is actually a mimer that was uh, from Tovresh Pei Dalid, originally published in Tovshin Tess. Friedrich Rebbe wasn't saying my modem any longer in 1949. And it's based on a mimer in Tovresh Samaches, which is 1904, or 1908, that the Rebbe Rashab said. And these my modem, um, and then the Rebbe has it as well in the, in the 80s, in the, in 1980, and then again, I believe in 1982 or 83. And the Rebbe, and the, the theme of the Maimer there is that the, bitter, the last bitter, the last refinement in Golas will be the Bnei Yishmol and Bnei Edom. From Golas Edom and Golas Yishmol. And he talks there, both collectively, the empires that existed, the four empires, the famous Cholom of Daniel, and there's the Medrashim that all talk about the four great empires. Mitzrayim, of course, is the Reish Kol Golias, like Kesed of Klippe. But then he talks about Bovel and about Poros and and Yovon, and Edom, which is Rome, and this is the Golas we are in now. But then there's also Golas Yishmol. Commentaries have a whole discussion about whether, the, whether Yishmol is concluded with Edom or it's two separate, but when you look at Chassidus, including in Shari Tshuva from the Mitla Rebbe and other places, they, they definitely talk about that the final bidder will be one with Yishmol, and it's based on the Zayar. In Shari Tshuva, the Mitla Rebbe says specifically, he brings the Zayar, 
which by Pasha he means uh, the Zer, and, and the Ve'era, Pasha Ve'era, and Pasha Bolg that I refer to. And you see, not so blatant, but you see the choreography. You see the hidden choreography hinted to and sometimes very directly discussed in the Maimar of Chassidus, but it's Pahavla because it's written a language of Chassidus. So you could, like, you know, you can see it as more of a theoretical thing. But in that Maimar, Tavshin Tess, and the other Maimar, when that's based on, he clearly says that Netzach and Hoid is Yishmal and Edem, and our Aved of Netzach and Hoid is what counterforce, is a counterforce to the clip of Netzach and Hoid. As I discussed, Netzach being determination, Hoid being Heida, acceptance. So even if you don't have Shlemus Hamidus of Chesed Gvura and Teferis, like he says in Basilagani, the famous Basilagani, that the Rebbe would explain in Chazar and every year, and Yud Shvat, the Midas and Etzachim, that is given to the Anoshim Pshutim, which is the Anshe Chayel, the simple front line, the infantry, which is us. You don't have to have Grace of Giluim and Aved the Primis, but the Kabbalah self, Nitzachim, the sheer determination to, be, to forge ahead. And with Haydah, with an acknowledgement and acceptance, that is the Aved of our time. So he clearly connects our personal service and our personal health. I'm talking about spiritual health, emotional health, and psychological health, with the welfare of the world. So that is relatively my short answer to the question of why it's all connected to my life, because it is applied. And Adarab, Adarab, personal Aveda and personal well-being is directly linked, and if you work on that, that itself is a way of making a contribution and proving and helping the situation as it is today. Okay. With that said, with that introduction, I want to continue some points in this regard, regarding the Sheva Mitzvah's Bnei Neach. I spoke about non-Jews. There were a number of questions about our attitude, our interacting with Um Elam, as we put it, the nations of the world. The relevance today couldn't be more relevant, because look what's going on. You have a world that's tumbling, an anti-Semitic uh, majority, or I don't know the numbers exactly, um, uproar against Israel, completely disproportionate, completely uh, one-sided, ignoring all kinds of other travesties, and that's just so. So we have to deal with that. We have, obviously, the wars being battled in the countries in the Middle East, besides Hamas and that's just so. But in the Iraq, in Syria, in Egypt, it's, uh, the world is up in flames. Not here to get now into a discussion of what our president and what the America is about in this regard. But the question, so we clearly have a situation of dealing with, inter, with non-Jews. And what should be our approach? So I discussed last episode, last week, at length, the, the Rebbe's position based on the Rambam and Hilchus Malachim, our attitude to non-Jews and so on. I want to continue this because there were a number of questions that were asked. And, um, but I want to begin with the rising anti-Semitism question, which we don't even want to mention it. The, can there be another Holocaust, God forbid? What does the Rebbe say? So let me address this. So there are, we know today that there are two Yechidison uh, that with, where it appears from the Rebbe have been said to Herbert Wiener from Nine and a Half Mystics and to Suedos, who published that article about he could melt a blizzard in uh, the New York Times that was published 20 years ago, approximately, on Gimel Thomas' time, where the Rebbe makes reference that when the, he was asked the question, could there be another Holocaust? He said, tomorrow morning. Absolutely possible. Now these are Yechidus, which means there was only one person there, and, uh, and that wasn't Barabim. I don't believe there's any Fabreng in the Rebbe such an alluding, or even alluding to something of that nature. On the contrary, there are quite a number of places that would suggest otherwise. So I'm not going to get into questioning whether what the Rebbe actually said, and what was the context. The Rebbe could also be referring to the idea that there is enough anti-Semites, and there's enough of that that can allow that condition and situation. But you don't see and consistently in the Rebbe's approach that we should be living in a paranoid state and uh, keeping our heads low um, and being afraid that will happen, which is what many Jews have an attitude. Like, for example, the public menorahs. The Rebbe, of course, initiated it and fought for it, public menorahs. What was the, one of the arguments against it by even Jews? Was we, Jews should not be too public. Let's not get their attention. Let's not arouse. Let's not provoke. Which, if there's a fear of another Holocaust, can be a legitimate fear. Now, I'm not saying that, that, that there's a contradiction. 
You could have the fear, or not the fear, you could know that it's possible and not have the fear. But you see from the Rebbe a very proactive approach with the non-Jewish world. He did not say, let's just protect ourselves, hide, or be a proud Jew and not be affected. But he went on an aggress- aggressive initiative, especially in the Tov Shin Mems, the Rebbe won an initiative that we should do everything possible to reach the non-Jews. Which leads me to a question that somebody asked, now, I'm, and then I'll get back to the actual topic. Someone asked the question, condescension. Teaching the seven mitzvahs of Noah to non-Jews is a condescending idea. This is what this fellow was writing. It's silly when a proselytizing Christian wants to tell Jews and other monotheists about the Lord. It's also silly when ultra-Orthodox Jews imagine they are going to teach the Gentile world about ideas that are integral to Christianity. People of faith can learn from each other, but only with respect, not condescension. And I should add, he writes, your book was very nice, but not quite as original as you think. Okay. So, I don't know who this is, because it's a confidential note. As you know that you can all post and Submit your questions completely confidentially and anonymously. At, uh, I should mention this as an opportunity. Where that can be done is at MeaningfulLife.com forward slash My Life Live. So I, I will respond just by re- what I read. First of all, it would be nice if you just added it's your opinion. You know, in your opinion, because this is clearly based on a person's individual experience. Everything can be done in a condescending way, even the best things in life. You could have your best friend and you could speak condescending to that person and say, hey, here's a book that you must read. If you don't read this book, you'll never be a perfect person. Or you can say, hey, my friend, I really read a beautiful book. It's very inspiring. It inspired me. Why don't you try it out? So it all comes down to how you present. Absolutely not condescension. It's, it's, It's a responsibility. If you really care about somebody, you really care not just about yourself, why would you not share something that gave you insight? God forbid somebody went through a loss. And you find somebody that's not Jewish, went through a loss, and you know them in some way or another, at work, a friend, a doctor, uh, whatever, whatever, however way. You meet them on a plane. Why not share with them something that may help them? And that's exactly what's incumbent upon us to do. So there's no condescension suggested. It's not about proselytizing. It's not about any type of uh, uh, patronizing. It's simply sharing and inspiring. And yes, an obligation that we, just like we share... Well, we went with other Jews, with our brothers and sisters, we share with our brothers and sisters that are not Jewish as well. I mean, brothers and sisters in the figurative sense of the word. I'm not going to comment about uh, whether my book is nice and as original as I think or not. First of all, I never made a statement how original it is. I'm not sure how you know what I think. Secondly, you know, these, as a writer, I can just say, what you write, you put out to the public and let everyone decide on their own how original or not original it is. And frankly, if you read the introduction to my book, I actually said that the best compliment that, that, that you can give someone, a teacher, and I would say this about the Rebbe as well, is that if they tell you it's not original, it's ideas that I always knew, I just didn't have the words for it. So we're not looking for originality, we're looking here for resonance, we're looking for emes. And I hope my book tried to live up to that by conveying the Rebbe's ideas and message. And that I leave everyone else to decide on that, but I just didn't want to censor the letter, I wanted to read it fully. Now, to go back to the topic, can there be another Holocaust? So, as I said, I did not hear from the Rebbe's words. He said, no, there cannot be. But I also didn't hear the other side except those Yechidison. And I should add, actually, we did hear from the Rebbe that there cannot be another Holocaust when he brought a number of times where he said in Fabrengens, and he cited um, that we're on, we're on the threshold of Gula, the world is ready, and all you have to do is open your eyes. So if there's a concern of another Holocaust, how could you say that? So I would submit, especially in the later years, it could be there was a time earlier that, that maybe a different perspective. But, after, but in the late Mems and the early Nuns, it would seem an absolute contradiction to state that there could actually be another Holocaust, which means the non-Jewish world is capable of pulling that off while saying that they're all ready and all you have to do is open your eyes. And he made, the Rebbe made it very clear when he said all ready, he meant the non-Jewish world. Didn't just mean the Jewish world. So that alone would imply that there cannot be. Did he say the words there cannot be another Holocaust? He said words that there will not be any more Hashmodes, Mishen Yetzig Ven Goig Mogig, Mishen Yetzig Ven with what happened in the last generation, etc., etc. So, yes, I would actually add, I'm correcting myself, that I would say based on those words that I've actually said, there will not be. And um, so people say, one second, people said that also earlier. Look, I'm not here to question the Rebbe. The Rebbe says something, 
and, and, and Baruch Hashem Azei the Matzav. There's no reason to second guess, and so on. Now let's go over to another question. We have in the Mitla Rebbe, in the beginning of Shari Tshuva, the Mitla Rebbe is a famous piece where he speaks from, the, from the, about Darizal, the time of Darizal. He speaks and he says the language that all the Hashmodis and the, the genocides and the killings that happened in the Middle Ages ended in the time of Darizal. The Lo Yir Eid. They will, no, they, they will no longer be. The Rebbe writes a number of places. He asks the Tzorachi and Gadol to cite exactly one of the places where the Rebbe brings it specifically. In the Sicha of, I believe, it's uh, Parsha Pinchas. Yes, Tov Shalam et Ches. Metzoy Shabbos Pinchas. Those who are bringing us were Metzoy Shabbos for that period of time. So the Rebbe says, Tzorachi and Gadol, what that means when we saw what happened in the last generation. So how could you say, V'lo Yiyayit? That there won't be any more of that. In, um, in a number of other places, the Rebbe also brings and discusses this. I just want to cite a few key things. In Tov Shalom Ates, there was an answer um, to, uh, to uh, Rabbi Munshine from Eretz Yisrael, the Forsher, the scholar, where he asked the Rebbe, this is a, a, a note from the, him, Metzoy Shabbos Kedr Zohar, Tov Shalom Ates. He asked the Rebbe, he said that he heard that this, actually the answer from the Rebbe is printed in Lekut Tzichas 30, chapter Chelik Lamet Ches, which means sex, uh, volume 38, page 183, only the Rebbe's answer. But he asked the Rebbe that he heard that the Rebbe asking a number of times, how do you explain the Shad Tshuva? Shad Tshuva, that there will no longer, from the time of Rizal, there was already, and there will no longer be any Hashmodis, any genocides. Well, the fact is that we see there was the Holocaust. So he says, writes to the Rebbe, when you look at Shara Tshuva, doesn't it talk there about Gzeda Shmat? We're talking about people, genocide that were um, perpetrated in order to convert the Jews. And if they converted, they were, pres- they were saved. Whereas in the last generation, he asked, there was no Shmodis of, of that type. The Rebbe puts a question mark and two exclamation points and writes, Does he then not know that all the pogroms that were Le'aleinu V'le'aleinu, the Rebbe said, this will never happen again, never happen again, in Russia and in Poland V'chulu, were only because of the religion. And, and the Rebbe says, in, in some places also Hitler, the Rebbe calls him here Gitler, that when you received a note from a, uh, from a Christian, you were, preser- you were saved. And some places they said clearly that a person who's ready to convert, they will not kill him. Even though the Rebbe says, Avshalei Ashkenaz, that not in Germany itself, that didn't happen. That's one thing the Rebbe writes. So in other words, what you're trying to tell me, that there's a distinction, that the, what the Shara Tshuva is saying, is talking about events, then which were only connected to Shmad, which was conversion and so on in religion. And whereas now, the that won't happen again. But this type of Holocaust was a completely different thing. The Rebbe says, absolutely not. So firstly, the pogroms he refers to, and the Holocaust also was absolutely connected to religion. Um, and then the Rebbe adds, when you look inside the Shad Tshuva, the Rebbe refers to it as the Geras Tshuva, but it's the same idea. So the Rebbe says, it's not Negea what the Goy thinks. The guy the, the, who perpetrated this, uh, this genocide. Because what he explains there is that what was the reason that those, those Hashemodis will not happen again? He says there's a reason for it. Because um, the Churban Beis Amikdash was due to Aved Zara. So therefore, the Jewish philosophers and thinkers of that time who not didn't remain rational, philosophical, philosophical, but gave their lives not to convert, they gave their lives, like Kiddush Hashem, that was a tikkun on the Churm based by Yisrishim. And therefore, it doesn't matter why they were killed. The fact is they were killed for this purpose. And the same thing the Rebbe says about the Holocaust, Mefursim, Sherubim, that the Gzairis, during the time of the Holocaust, were Kiddush Hashem, the Jews died in Kiddush Hashem. So it's basically, it doesn't matter what the intention is, 
the fact that they died. And he says, Lo ate. So why did this happen? The Rebbe then continues and says, There may be a consideration to answer that there in Shar Tshuva from Mitla Rebbe, he's talking about the Tikkun Chet Aved Zara. That's all. And that was finished with. But the Rebbe says, Gamza Dechig, this too is difficult to say because it's not the simple Pshat Lo Yeid. Anyway, the bottom line is you see that the Rebbe is emphasizing and pushing that, that, he, that uh, asking the big Tzarek in God why there was a Holocaust. Why is he pushing that? Why can't you just say it could happen any time? If he's saying, can you see that the Rebbe wants to make sure that it doesn't happen and he's making clear that he's learning the Lo Yeid Kipshute and it's a big question why it happened. So to suggest that could happen again would be opposite of the whole spirit of what the Rebbe is saying. Just for a complete picture, if you want more to look into this, you could also look in the Tov Shinun Aleph when the Rebbe spoke about whether it's a punishment. He made it very clear you can't say the Holocaust is a punishment, but it's a gzeda. And therefore, the Rebbe basically, he brings there the Shar Tshuva as well and says from there you see that you cannot say that it's a, a punishment at all. And also, I would suggest to look at Chelech Chof Aleph page 347, 397, I'm sorry. And finally, um, in the Igris Kedish of the Rebbe, volume 10, page Kuf Samach Tes, 169, he also talks about it, and also pushes away this answer. In addition, there's a note that he wrote to Rabbi Mangel, who also asked this question, and the Rebbe too there referred to that it's a, that it's a Gilgal day edition. In other words, it's suggesting that that answer, but ultimately the Rebbe doesn't accept the yeah. answer of the Bayasheni because it says Lay Eid, and the Rebbe wants that to be Kipshute, which means that it will not happen again. Anyway, I felt it was very interesting to bring all of this, and let's move on now to an, continuing this discussion. Okay, thank you for addressing the next question, the Sheva Mitzvah Bnei Neich in episode 30. That was last week. But I always struggle with the end of chapter 1 in Tanya where it discusses the loftiness of a Jewish nesham as opposed to others. Where he says clearly, How do we understand this in context to looking at non-Jews? So it's an excellent question. The Rebbe and the Mems especially starts focusing on bringing Shev Mitzvah to all the non-Jews based on the Rambam at the end of chapter 8 of Hilchus Malachim. How does that fit? When the Alter Rebbe says clearly in Tanya that the Gimel Kibbutzat Meis Ein Behem Tev Klal, and any Tev you do see, any good is Ligramayu, the Isyayet, for their own to serve themselves for their own good, etc. And we know Shlosh Kibbutzat Meis has to be completely annihilated and destroyed, not like Klipas Nega. Well. Let's address this now, and uh, we all know that Rabbi Hillel Paracher brings in his beard and Kuntus, his palace of the Mitla Rebbe, he brings the name of the Alter Rebbe, that Chesidu Umes Elam is Menega, Meklipas Nega. Based on the Rebbe saying that the Gula is on the, we're at the threshold of the Gula, and that uh, all we have to do is open our eyes, and we have to bring Elokus to the Velt, including non Jews. One would have to say that the Rebbe feels that we're at a space, place where all the non-Jewish world are at least in a potential state of chesedu meseil. And lo yi esik kol elam el lo dasas Hashem blavat. That will be with the, with the Rambam's words at the end of Hilchus Malachim. When Mashiach comes, that will be the case. So you have to say that the Alter Rebbe is talking about the darga of goyishkeit in goyim. What do I mean by that? Maisek nani. A goy in the real, real sense of the goy is But if a goy takes upon himself, or maybe after all the generations of refinement, there becomes a collective change in goyish consciousness, so to speak, in the veltish consciousness, then they're capable of becoming chsidu misayelam. Maybe they're not there yet, but we're at that stage where they could be. Again, I don't know how many. I don't, I've looked around the sikhs. There's no numbers for it. But clearly, everyone is in that potential state. So, of course, you're going to ask, how does that fit with ISIS and Hamas and others that are beheading people, etc., etc.? Well, you know something? 
maybe if we send the right message and we were very adamant about it and very passionate about it, which we'll soon address as well, I'm not saying, I'm not being naive, but maybe if we took the lead, maybe we could affect even them as well. And I'll address the Muslims in a minute. But the point I want to make here is that the Tanya Peda Caliph remains intact. As a matter of fact, does it settle where the people ask the Rebbe whether they should skip over certain parts of Tanya when they're teaching it in English because it'll be, bring up too many questions, etc. And the Rebbe says, absolutely mufrach, absolutely not. And um, yet at the same time, at the same time, because the emiss of what says in Tanya remains. And the Rebbe actually says in one of those places where he says about uh, should, you, should we skip parts of Tanya, the Rebbe says to go to Aposh Tachsid Shahid and ask him, why? Because there's nothing to be ashamed of. I remember one speaking somewhere, in Woodstock it was, and uh, after my talk, a guy gets up and says, you speak very beautifully, it's, it's very presentable, and so on, but you choose to uh, selectively ignore certain things in Chassidus. So I saw who is coming, where he's going. He says, how do you explain the end of chapter one of Tanya? The attitude to non-Jews. And he had a follow-up question, and he said, does anybody ever ask that question of you? So I said to him, yes, you know, your second question answers your first question. People do ask me this question, but it's only, only Jews that ask this question. I never get the question from non-Jews. Jews have some type of inferiority complex and some paranoia, whatever it may be, in Regish Nechitut, they call it in Hebrew, and there's a chip on the shoulder that we don't like what it says there. But if you know, if you read it properly, you may not think it to be quite as r- radical as it may sound initially. So yes, the Jews have the problem with it. There are millions of Christians in America that travel to Israel, especially now, that say this is, the Jews are the chosen people, and this is their promised land, and not one inch of the land should be given up. Why don't they have a problem with that? So let me just say the following. There's a letter that, I'm, that I was going to read, at least excerpts of it, a very powerful letter, where the Rebbe says, and I just want to read one section from it. This is a letter from Tovshin Lamed Dalad. It's in English, Rishchidosh Tevis. It talks about Israel in general. But I want to say one thing, and then maybe I'll refer to it in another part of this episode. The Rebbe is talking about Eretz Yisrael and what we can do. So he says, as for, as far as, as for the practical thing which Jews everywhere can do to help the present situation, and he means in Israel, something which is most regrettably ignored, in line with playing down the obvious divine intervention in the most critical days of the war, he's talking about the Yom Kippur War, is that every Jew must strengthen his bonds with a traitor from Sinai when God made us this chosen people. This is the Rebbe's words now. This is also something of which we need not be ashamed. For contrary to those who misunderstand and misrepresent this in terms of privilege, which smacks of chauvinism, the Rebbe writing, this chosenness is primarily a matter of duty and obligation to be a model people for the whole world to emulate. A people where form takes precedence over matter, the spiritual over the material, and the soul over the body. A people which was destined to be a light unto the nations. Isaiah 42, 6, etc. It is this kind of life and conduct which the Torah describes that also stimulates right thinking and the proper outlook, outlook on life. It is this kind of life that also strengthens the self-confidence of every Jew, wherever he may be, and enables him to shed any inferiority complex and the readiness to be impressed by a goy or by an idea which comes from a goy or actually non-Jewish ideology. It is sad indeed when instead of being a model and a living example for non-Jews to emulate, some Jews fall over themselves to emulate non-Jews, rejecting the spring of living waters, the Jewish Torah and Jewish tradition, etc. The Rebbe then continues on with psychological application of that. He says, I should read it already. It is surely unnecessary to point out to you an MD, the psychological factor which has such an important role when two adversaries and two adversaries confront each other. When the adversary sees that his, appointment, his, his opponent is spiritually and psychologically strong and self-confident and certain of his just cause and not prone to be impressed by the adversary or any non-Jew due to the inferiority complex mentioned above, this is the best way of preventing wars, not only major wars, but even wars of attrition. It is hardly to be expected that a Jew who in his personal life 
is afraid to show that he is a proud Jew, whether at home or outside, who prefers to stick his library, to stack his library, with non-Jewish volumes and authors, etc., and who makes sure to bring up his children in a way that when they walk in the street, they should show no signs of being Jewish. Yet this same Jew should draw the line and take a different posture when he meets a political adversary and engages in political negotiations with representatives of other countries. Could such a Jewish representative truly consider himself at least equal to the Gentile adversary in such a confrontation, having tried all his life to emulate and follow slavishly the Gentile world and way of life? You get the idea. So at the end of chapter 1 in Tanya, let's talk about it for a moment. Without any cheshbenus, as a chesposha tachsidah is it possible that the Alter Rebbe and Teda in general, first of all, Teda Kal, what the Alter Rebbe quotes from Eitz Chaim and from and Gemara Chesed Lum Chatas is not his original writing. Not one word there is original end of Teda Kal. So let's make it clear it's not a Psatanya thing. The Alter Rebbe explains it and uses it. And he writes at the end of Teda Kal if he doesn't, it's not buried somewhere later. Is it possible that the Teda, Teda's Chesed, which Adam Arishan created, and it says, Chaviv Adam Shaniver B'Tzalem. It's a Mishnah, which is referring to non Jews, because afterwards it says, Chivin Yisrael, and then Chivin Chisrael says, Kibbul, that says, Nitlehem Klei Shor is the Teda. Chaviv Adam Shaniver B'Tzalem. The Alter Rebbe should hold that suddenly Goyim are what trash? God forbid. God created them. B'Tzalem Elikim. Now, but then, the whole purpose of life is there's a thing called Goyishkeit. Goyishkeit means Elam Hazah Hagashmi Vachumri, which manifests in nations like Avram Avinu, Mi Yitn Toyer Metame. He came from a pagan world. And Mamata Lamaili, he searched for God. From a Goyisha world, he created a world of spirituality, a godly world, and ultimately became Av Amoin Goyim, teaching it to everyone. And his children, and our children afterwards, Be'em Bonov, Be'se Achrov, Lasis Doka and Mishpat, until his children and grandchildren were Zeicha to be received the Teda, Matan Teda. And we know the Teda was given not just for the Jews, it was given, like the Rambam Paskins in the end of Pedic Ches of Hilchus Melachim, but also to teach morality, like the Rebbe says here, to be a role model. So chosenness is chosen to be a role model, to be a light unto nations. Something to be ashamed of? On the contrary, the greatest mission in life. And when the Abister went to Bnei Yishmol and Bnei Esav to give them the Teda, it wasn't, as we discussed in the last episode, a, a, a trick. It was because they ultimately are children of Avram. They are the ancestors of most of the uh, world today. Maybe all the world, when you count Bnei Ketura, the Kedem, for that are also children of Avram, Bnei Hagar, etc., Bnei Ketura. And why? Because ultimately all the children of Avram Avinu will embrace God's message, each in their own way. So hence, the um, obligation of Sheva Mitzvah's Be'neach is to reveal the Tzalem Elikim, the divine image that every non-Jew was created. Because that's where they originate. That is the, that is the way Goyishkeit began. Pagans, Evdi Aved which Aved Zara is everything antithetical to God. But if a Goy accepts and embraces Avram's approach, and eliminates Aved Zara from his life. And eliminate that. He's called Chesidu Maseilam. And therefore he's Klippas Nega. And when the Rambam says, Mola Aras Deyes Hashem, the world will be filled with divine knowledge, he's talking about a Goyesha world. Obviously that's not Shol Shlip Zatmeis, and Eved Aved Zara. It doesn't go hand in hand that they're Ladasas Hashem Bovad. Oz Epech El Amim. Beisi Zu, Beisi Tfilah Lekola Amim. They're coming to the Beis Amigdash and see that as their house of prayer. Etc, etc. And all the Nevuas. So the Al Tareb knew of course all of this. Pashat Mitzad is on Lamdus, and yet he talks about it because the Nefesh, the Nefoshes, where do they originate from? Each one originates. The Nefesh Abamis of a Eden Klippas Neger, the Nefesh Abamis of a non Jew in Shlosh Klippas Atmeis. And then he says, the good they do is only for themselves. Let, let me ask you something. The Rambam Paskins from Kedush Mesech to Kedush, Le'elim Yasser God, the Meter Mitzvah Shalelishma, Shemetech Shalelishma, Bolishma. He says, only one man, Avram Oyevi, did something for no ulterior motive. Everyone does everything for, for ulterior motive. How is that different than the Gramayu? So there's all kinds of explanations that, that the Banefer Shabamis, it, it does it talk for yourself, but it's not completely for yourself. There is also for the good of it. 
There's different explanations on the, on the explanation. But you see, it's not such a simple matter. In the Gramayu itself, there are many reasons. You can do something. Someone gives Dukkah to be, to get covered. Isn't that Lysiah? So does that not go in the same category of Eches Lum and Chattas? Just trying to point out how when you start looking into it, it's more complicated than just saying, this one's good, this one's not. And the Lashen Eimbem Tev Kalal, by the way, the Semach Tzedek and the Rebbe Rasha make it very clear. Eimbem Tev Kalal Batz Musam, meaning Mitzad Atzmam. Like Shol Shkripas Atmeis, everything has a spark of the divine. The question is, if the spark is like Chatich Nas Nevela, and therefore became completely like a black hole swallowed up by the dark, but you have to say there's always Tev. I'm not going to get into the dynamic, how does somebody go over from Shol Shkripas Atmeis to Chsidu Meseilam. There's, there isn't a lot of biurim in this in Chsidus, Bagoim. It talks about it a bit. We could talk about Shuva, how a person does Shuva in Pedig Zayin and Tanya, how also be Dech and then you turn it into Shol Shkripas Atmeis through Shuva. But that's after the fact. But non Jews is probably not quite like that. And we have to also remember that the non Jewish world has been refined over hundreds of years. And we live in a far more humane world. So that is number one. Two more things I want to say about self Pedic Aleph of Tanya. Again, I refer to the Ha'ara and the Rebbe in, in Kutta Sichis, volume 13, page 230. I also refer to you to um, look there where he brings all kinds of rice. It's the Gemara that says that our Isaac. Ha'akum she'esik b'teda is k'ayin gadol she'nichnas l'flayin l'fnim. It's considered like a high priest going in the in, in the inner chambers. The Gemara Rashi explains it means b'sheva mitzvahs did who, but still learning teda, not in the teda. That's not shayach to him. So you see that there's the how do you zatch him with all that we're talking about? Because there's a pchira there too, and non-Jews also have pchira varay this charva enish, different type of pchira, different level of pchira. However you want to explain it. And of course, the Mishnah said, Chavev Adam Shenevir B'Tzalan. Two more things I'd like to point out is in Lekut HaSich, volume 15, a Noyach Sich, about Akum Shoshav is Chayev Misa. Beautiful Sich, the Rebbe explains that then, why would non-Jews not allowed to keep Shabbos? Shabbos reminds us of God, as the Chinuch writes. Not only they're not allowed to keep it, you say if they keep it, they're Chayev Misa. What's, what's wrong with keeping it? And there's even questions whether they're allowed to keep it on Sunday. The kids of the Rebbe's answer is, Goyim are Mamalak Their job is L'Sheva Sitzara, Adam L'Om Yavalad, to transform this world. So what means one day you take off? I, Eden, because Eden have an addition to the Mamalak and an element of Seva of Kalalman, which is they bring in a Lukus that's higher than Velt, that Shabbos. Each plays their role. So just like for a Jew, it's a mitzvah to work six days of the week, he can't say I can keep Shabbos six days of the week. As a matter of fact, it says in Sifri, it's a mitzvah sasa. You can't sit around bottle. So for a non-Jew, it includes also the seventh day. What do you see from this? That take away, take away the Shalosh Klippus Atmeyes, a non-Jew has a role to play. The role is to transform this world and bring Elokus. Elokus. Sheresh HaNevroim, Elokus Lefiyar HaChailim, however you want to explain it. And on the other hand, there's another thing to bring in Hechef Avelt. Elokus that's higher than the world. And it's not mutually exclusive. Because as the Rambam, the Alta Rebbe brings in Teir Eir, the Rebbe brings that in Lekut Tzich is there, and Chelik Gimel, that there were philosophian people who dedicate their entire life to Muscolas and to spirituality. So you can have a Sevu Klam even by a non-Jew, and you, and you have a Mala Klam by a Jew, Varaya, we also work, we're also part of this world. So when he speaks in the Rambam, Lo Yei you could say for non-Jews primarily Mala Klam. But Mala Klam is Gansa Fayna Madrega. It's a lakus, havayu hu elakim. There's no two gods. It's God manifesting in the structure of existence. Elakim gimatri hateva. And then there's higher. And remember, they, they obviously speak to each other. So you can't say it's completely two different worlds. However, there's hamavdil ben Yisrael amim. The hamavdil on this level is not necessarily between shalosh tipus atmeis and klipas nega. It could be the klipas nega of chesidu and the klipas nega of Jews because they have different roles. In a pure world where you don't have a Vedazara anymore, and you don't have Shol Shkrips Atmeya's behavior, and you have a, a moral, ethical world, there's also a distinction between Jew and non-Jew. Nothing wrong with that. Just like there's a distinction between Kohanim, Levim, and Yisrael. So I would say that in the earlier generations, Goyishkait was the, 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 the dominant feature, was Shol Shkrips Atmeya's, because that's the world that they lived in, pagans, and so on. 
But in the later generations, as the world became more refined, the non-Jewish world has moved more to its natural mamalik halam state, which is Adam Adishim B'Tzalem Elikim, Chaviv Adam Shanivri B'Tzalem. Jews uh, elevate to more of a Sevil Kalam in place. And obviously, there's more work to be done. But this is an attitude, an approach, that can tell us that we're on the direction and close to the Geula itself. And the Tanya Pedek Aleph will be taught and learned even after Geula, Mashiach comes. We're not going to censor and say, the Rab Alter Rebbe writes in Pedig Zayin and Tanya Belem of his Nutzach, that there will no longer be Shalosh Tripsat Satmeis when Mashiach comes. Are we going to learn Pedig Pedig Zayin and Tanya? Has Rishon to say not? It's the same Tanya. It's Teireh. Will we learn Hilchas Aved Zod and Rambam? Will we learn about Aved Zod and Chumash? Teireh Zunitzchis. However, it may not be applicable, like the Rebbe speaks about Mitzvah's Teilis, it may not be applicable in action because you don't have that situation. Or you can say, Beruchni is there's always a Dakas Dika Aveda Shazar or some type of spiritual version as you climb. A Bgut is Bgut is Bessin is Bessin. So compared to a higher Madre, like the Alter Rebbe says at the end of Igeras HaKedish, Simen Chavov, what will be once there's no more Tuma and Tara? What will we learn? Will be, what, why are we learning? There'll be Aliyah in Gdusha itself. I these halachas, she'll have to explain them, just like Istakal bar Isa bar Alma, and Tere Kodma Le'elam. However, you did Tere, it goes Tuma and Tara and Movis, as the Zayar asks. Before creation, that's how it will be lost in love. So we'll learn about going, we'll learn about Shal Shkipas but we'll learn about it as either as a concept or as a Dakas Dika level that compared to a higher level, this is Shal Shkipas however you explain it. So we anyway going to have to come and explain the whole state of the non-Jewish people, and when these non-Jews are sitting and learning chsidus, and they're learning and they're open up a tanya they'll probably explain to us what it means. So you have to be, understand the concept, and then you have to understand its application in each period of time. Okay. More can be said, and I'm sure there's plenty of controversy as it is, and I'm sure, I hope to get Ant's questions from you and rebuttals and so on. And keep it coming. So are we afraid of raising anti-Semitism? My answer short briefly is, yes, we're aware of it, not afraid of it. But make, the Rebbe makes it very clear in the letter I read from Tav Shalom Adalit, that we have to, Ad Rebbe, this is the time where we have to show example. We have to be a living role model. Okay, but then the question becomes, what, what, what do we do? Fine, that's fine. You can say the Christian Western world, like the United States of America, is based on the principles of all men are created equal. There are inalienable rights. Most, much of the Western world is based on these principles. Yes, there's individual anti-Semitism. But on, a, but on, a, uh, but on an institutional level, governments, you can sue someone for being anti-Semitic. No? And even in Russia... President Putin happens to be kind to Jews. But there is a certain sensitivity that didn't exist 50, 60, 100 years ago. Can that change? Can legislation change? I've never seen from the Rebbe, the Rebbe afraid that the United States is going to change its laws about religious freedom regarding Jews. Can Everything can, but based on our march toward Geula, based on the refinement that has been going on, there's no reason to accept that, no reason to be afraid of it. But we have to do a job. Not only shouldn't we be ashamed, we should be standing and being leaders of morality. We should be the shining role models of what it means to be a godly person in the world. The Rebbe's words, they're tremendous. He says to be a model of what? Of a nation that sees, that, that emulates. A people from where the pres- they take precedence of spirit, form takes precedence over matter. The spiritual over the material and the soul over the body. To teach the world what it means to be a refined human being. Now, are you going to ask, what do we do now with the Muslim world? This is fine, you can say, with the Christian world, or the Western world, American world, however you. What do we do in the Muslim world? We'll be seeing beheadings. we see behavior that goes back to the Middle Ages, savagery, and so on. So let's, think, let's, let's talk about that moment. What is the Rebbe's attitude to that? So firstly, if you go to all these answers I've already cited and others, the Rebbe sees this, like Siddhis says, from the Zoya, Seif Pasha, Ve'era, and Bolok, as part of the final bitter, the bitter of, Ed, of Yishmael. If Yishmael is perhaps now where the Christians were in the 15th century, the 16th century. Not that we have to wait three, four more centuries, but it's a stage. Because they're saying it in the name of God. Now, I never heard from the Rebbe that the Rebbe dismissing Muslims. On the contrary, I heard from different Askonim 
In Washington, they once, saw, they once established something. Rabbi Shemtov told me this. And they said it was a Christian Judeo so-called project. And the Rebbe said that should, he should work and make sure to include the Muslims in it. If the Muslims are all fanatics and they're, and they're middle-aged um, savages, well, the Rebbe would never say that. On the contrary, halachically, we know actually that Islam is closer to monotheism than Christianity in some ways. And the Rambam says very clearly in the, pay, the section that censored the end of chapter 11, Hilchus Malachim, what does he say? He says that both Christianity and Islam, even though he calls him what he calls him, it came by Ashgachel Yena, the Sadis, whatever, the mysteries of God's ways, to pave the world toward the ghoul. And the Muslims then were not exactly more refined than they were today. So you have to say there's a distortion of how they're using the beliefs of Abraham. And they're using Taylor in a distorted way. I don't want to even compare it, but Lahav the Elif Avdolas, Elif Avdolas. Bedakas the Dakas. Rajbi comes out of the Maida, comes out of hiding. After 12 years. You can imagine how refined he was. So the Gemara says, wherever he looked at, began to burn. So the Ebersheh said, you're not ready to come out. Because he saw the pettiness, the, the materialism, the superficiality of life, it just began to burn, physically, spiritually, however. The Ebersheh said, you're not ready yet. Go back a 13th year, Bar Mitzvah. Then he came out and says, everything, wherever he went, he repaired. Which is a higher spiritual level? To burn the world up with your spiritual state or to refine? The answer is obvious. I am not comparing Lahavdal of Havdalas, but there's an element of religion when it's not properly balanced, when there's chesed without the balance of gvura. Yishmol without gvura. Or gvura without chesed, where it gets radical, and it can destroy the world. So I am not in any way suggesting that these ISIS and others are on the level of such spirituality that they're burning the world. There's no question that it's feeding into their savagery, into their bestiality, into the lowest common denominator and the most, lo- the, 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 the most inferior part of what a human being can do, beneath even being human. But the distortion of the thinking that God wants, that infidels, and idol worshippers, or devil worshippers as they put it, should be beheaded, that coming the distortion on the spiritual level is because there's a distortion of the whole meaning of religion. <clears throat> so what does the Rebbe have to say about this? So there's an interesting Yechidus. That the Rebbe had in 1980, it's now in video, in audio actually, where the Rebbe had in 1980 with Moti Eden. He was a broadcast journalist for Kol Yisrael, Israel Radio, and later he became a director of Israel's Channel One Television. What does the Rebbe say there? He asked the Rebbe that he sees that the Rebbe is putting a lot of emphasis. It was the beginning of Tzivus Hashem, Tavshin Mem, a lot of emphasis on rallies for children, and he's wondering why, and especially in times of crisis, he sees that the Rebbe does that, crisis in Israel and so on, putting emphasis on the children. The Rebbe's answer is mind-blowing. And we hear the audio. There's an audio of the Rebbe Zichidus. He speaks in Hebrew. Briefly, the Rebbe says like this. That I want to firstly begin that we don't like to make havchadis, which I want to emphasize here as well, because ivdu Hashem besimcha, so we're not trying to frighten anybody, and everything has to always be done with positive note. But the Rebbe says, according to the ideas, the intelligence I'm receiving from Washington, and Washington today is a place where all the intelligence comes through Washington, is that there's been come a, a major shift going on in the Muslim world. He says, years ago, the Rebbe says 10 years ago, 20 years ago, whatever, who ruled the Muslim world? It was sheikhs. They were the leaders. And you could buy them off. You could buy them off with money. You could buy them off with a good car, and so on. And the youth followed along. So you're able to control them to some extent by buying them off. So today what's happening is that the young Muslims... This is 1980, long before the Arab Spring. What are we talking? We're talking here 20, 30, 34 years ago. 1999, 19, 2000. Yeah. The Rebbe says a shift is happening. The young Muslims today are developing, becoming more and more fanatics. The Rebbe used the word fanatics than their parents and grandparents. And they cannot be bought off. That's what's happening. 
And then the Rebbe compares it. He says, and by Jews, the opposite is happening. Whereas once there was a spirit of halutzim, people, pioneers, the settlers, to transform and to be pioneers in Israel. Now the youth are losing that. And they say, just leave me alone. Let me be at peace. Let me be quiet. Exact opposite of what's going on. So the Rebbe says, so I feel the need to instill in the youth the passion again. That's why we gather Jewish children together, here and in Israel, and everywhere where there are Jews. And what do we do? We say, Shema Yisrael. We're telling you. You're not just uh, uh, of, of this generation. You are a nation that goes back 20, 30 generations. And when the Ebishter said Shema Yisrael, and Shema Yisrael, it didn't just mean Yisrael then. The Rebbe says, Moshe, Shleime, I think he says Yitzchak. Today, says Shema Yisrael, you're connected to all of that. To instill in Jews the sense of pride, their connection to the Ebishter, to Teda, and of course to Yisrael. What is the Rebbe saying here? That the, unfortunately, they have become more passionate and fanatic, where money and materialism can't buy them off, and tragically, by the Jews, the exact opposite, becoming more complacent and more apathetic, and we have to reconnect, because without passion, you're not going to beat them. He doesn't say these words, but it's an obvious statement, and I brought it also uh, last, uh, a few weeks ago, from Sichel, from Purim Tav Shechav Hei. When there's passion in a gay and nefesh, you can beat big armies. When it's a piseichel, you're going rationally, you have a strong army and you're rational and so on. I'm not talking about being irrational, but there has to be a passionate connection. You're fighting for our holy land. It's ob- obscene to say. America doesn't, Americans don't, don't, are not natives of this country. They killed the Native Americans. A few number of years ago, if you remember, Great Britain sent a flotilla, sent armies to go secure the Falkland Islands that Argentina was claiming and it's not even the mainland of Britain. That's what they did. Israel, a nation that is here for thousands of years, connected to this land, where's that passion? The passion should be stronger than any Muslim passion. And they would respect that. And now I'm quoting from other places, but that is, that's the Yechidus I wanted to refer to. You go back to that letter, Tav Shalom Adal, the Rebbe says basically the same thing. He says that we are in control of our own destiny. And we can do whatever it is that we are capable of doing. So you have to have that connection in that level. So are we afraid of Muslim fanaticism? No, we're not afraid of it. As a matter of fact, everything has a lesson. We have to learn from the passion. Obviously, it's an obscene one. And it's misplaced. But remember, even the most distorted, misplaced, and perverted passion beats rational uh, mediocrity, rational apathy. If you're apathetic, if you're rational and apathetic, there's no match to someone who's irrational and passionate. We have to turn it into a passion. The netzach and hoid, the determination and the hoid, and the hoid, and the commitment of a passion, a commitment and, an, and a passion that is beyond anything that uh, they, they achieve. So that's the answer. We have to take the lead and we have to develop a approach that will supersede and overpower what they have to achieve. Now, because time is limited and I wanted to cover more subjects, as usual, it doesn't work out, but so be it. So I want to just conclude in the last few minutes that we have with the Rebbe's directives for the month of El. And it's not a, it's not a new subject even. It's everything's Ashgacha Pratis. All these events really exploded basically in Tammuz and Ov, in the Saturdays leading through Tisha B'Av. El, as we discussed, is an outgrowth of Aryeh, Rosh Tevis, El, Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur, Heshayin, Rabbe. It's an outgrowth of all of that. And El... I want to go over some of the Rebbe's heros about El because it has impact not only in our personal lives but also on the events in Eretz Yisrael. And the topics that I have not been able to to cover here, I will, please God, cover in the coming episodes. But I thought this discussion was very important. So I want to just discuss a few things about the heros of El. Okay. 
So, first of all, we all know the Melon Basod, the analogy that the Rebbe gives, the Alter Rebbe gives in the Kut the the A, asking the question, why? Is El not a month of holidays? It should be a month of holidays because is the gili of Yud Gimel Midas Harachamim. We know a holiday is basically a gili of a higher presence. So why is the whole El not a, 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 day, a month of holidays? So he gives the Moshal. The Melech in the holidays, Melech Behechel is when he's coming back, Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur, the high holidays. But he's on a journey back to the palace. On his way into the palace, before he reaches there, he greets and meets the people of the field. So we have the Melech in the field. So Yud Gimel Midas Arachim is in the field, which means Yimei Achel. And this is an opportunity to go and ask the king anything you want. You have access. So this Moshul reigns supreme in the Rebbe's words about El, to know that we have a special opportunity as we enter the month of El. It's easier to access and easier to communicate. And how do we do so? There's the famous five Rosh Hashanah the Rebbe speaks about El, starting with Anila Deidi Videidi Li, self-initiative. And the Rebbe says these five correspond to the five foundations. First of all, the three pillars upon which the world rests, Teira, Avedi, Gemilas, Chasadim, to add in study of Teira, to add in Zdok, and to add in Davening. In some places it says that Rebbe cites they should actually, some, some people minimize less learning and more davening, more tefillin, tachnunim. The other two Rosh Hashanah, one is tshuva. Tshuva is return, not just repent. Re- reconnecting to our source. And the final gu'ula, the emphasis on gu'ula. These are the five Rosh Hashanah. The Rebbe speaks about therefore adding, increasing in all those kavim, and all those kavim in Avedah. What else can we say? There's obviously also everything is done with Simcha. The Rebbe focuses a lot about the Simcha that should be done during this period of time. And obviously, Aves Yisrael. We, the meaning is to start writing. And now let us Some start to Ba'av, but definitely from Rishchei Deshel. But that doesn't just, it's not just signing a nice uh, message, but it's an it's a attitude of Aves Yisrael. So it's an opportunity to connect. Now tell me, is this not most relevant today? In a world where there's such anti-Semitism, where there's what's going on in Eretz Yisrael, Jews being attacked just because they're Jewish, what's going on in other parts of the world, this is the time where we have to just rise to the occasion and put aside our differences, especially petty ones, and say, you know something? There's something more important in life than my own little chashbenes. And this is the month to do so. Um, let's see, any other things that I would focus on? I'm sure there's more. But we'll focus on more. We're going to be in month of El next week as well. So let me conclude with a bracha ksiv v'chsimeteva, l'shana teva mesuka for every Jew everywhere, both here, both in Eretz Yisrael especially, where it needs a special bracha. And it has a special bracha because eni Hashem al-kecha bo meresh z'ashana v'ad achrishan. As the Alter Rebbe brings in Simen Yudalad in the Geras HaKedish, that that refers to achrishan, meresh z'ashana, is refers to this time of year, the end of the year, going into Rosh Hashanah where a new er chodosh a new opportunities, a new power of Sholem, of Ahdus, and eliminating all this tzadus and tzad and pain and fears and running, etc., will be eliminated and should be Sholem in the whole world, not just to the Jewish world, to the entire world. We pray for all the nations. And all the nations are infected by how we behave. So the Ebeshe should help us all that we should use this time well, both in our personal Aveda. And that itself will spill over from Elam Katan Zah Adam, the human being being the small universe, to spill over to the entire world. That should finally be before the end of the year, before even Rosh Chodesh should be a complete peace, a real peace, a permanent peace, but only with strength, one that brings God into the world and understands how to balance faith, passion, and uh, and and loving one another. As Avram Avinu prayed for infidels, he didn't behead them, he didn't kill them. Rachman al Islam. So we should only have peace and we should only have good news. So until next week, this has been My Life. Chassidus Applied, episode 31, next week again from 8 to 9. I look forward. And please send in your questions to MeaningfulLife.com forward slash My Life Live. Anonymous and confidential. If you want to write to me personally, write to Simon, S-I-M-O-N, S-I-M-O-N at MeaningfulLife.com. This has been My Life, Chassidus Applied, episode 31. Everyone should have a very blessed week.